All right, so let's, let's start getting into this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I'm ready to give it the first take, but one more question. Yep. Is this, so like my, very quickly, and I say thank you for coming here tonight. Right. I mean, clearly that it's not the courtroom version. Today, so, yeah. so today, okay, yeah, yeah just yeah. clean it up a yeah. little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, firstly, let me thank you for being here today. Now I will cut right to it. In the next few minutes, I will describe to you the who, the what, the why, and the wear of this case. Hello, my name's Rob Talek. I represent the plaintiff. There were 17 individuals and that you pled guilty to abuse. Yes. You were convicted of that along with other crimes in June of 2011. The plaintiff, my client, is seated here to my right. His name is Mr. Rod McLeod. I bet some of you already have a pretty good idea what this case is about. You're about to hear the story of Rod's life. A key piece of it, the sexual abuse he suffered at the hands of Father Hod Marshall. Most of these victims were boys when you sexually abused them. That's right. The other side of this case is the Brazilian Fathers of Toronto. They are a Roman Catholic religious order. And most of these victims were boys at schools you were working at at the time you abused them. Most, yes. They employed a priest by the name of Father Hod Marshall. You've been convicted of sexual offenses? That's right. And you were sentenced to a two-year prison term? Yes. And you served 16 months of that and then was placed and were placed on parole? That's right. Father Marshall was originally part of this lawsuit, but he died recently over the course of it. Is it fair to say that almost every school you taught at, you would have sexually touched boys? With a few exceptions, yes. You will be tasked at the end of this case with determining the level of financial compensation that Rod will receive. Where will this money come from? It will come from the Brazilian fathers. Let's take some of that money they've amassed and put it back where it really belongs, into the hands of a victim of Father Marshall, Mr. Rod McLeod. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what punitive damages are for, to denounce and deter that type of misconduct. I decided early on that I felt that it was my duty. Yes, I'd been silent for 55 years, but now I had to do the opposite. I had to open the window and vent all of what had gone on in order to finally start to set the record straight. Not just for myself, but for all the others who had been sexually abused just as I had. Well, in some ways, uh, I uh, think of the church as the main perpetrator. Uh, yes, they didn't physically do, but what they did was they enabled the, the physical um, uh, perpetrator to, to hide, to move, to do again, over and over again. Why would they do that? Why would they uh, allow someone to sexually abuse children in their care? So long ago. And yet it 
minutes like it was yesterday. And you see, this is exactly the way it was back then when I was here, no question. It brings back that, that feeling of uh, having to flee, uh, getting ready to flee. It's uh, disturbing. When the, the one that you have to flee from is in such a position of authority and respect, and it's not like a, a school bully or something that you can just run away from. See, if he comes around the corner, he's got you. So it was always a, a game of cat and mouse. And of course, I was the mouse. That's it. Sweet. Here you go. You guys, you came far away oh, there. Thank okay. You, sir. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Take care. Okay. I have been called the priest hunter before. I don't see priest hunter as a derogatory term. I mean, the priests that I'm hunting deserve to be hunted, and someone else should have hunted them out long ago, namely the church itself. Rod's case went to trial because Rod's singular motivation was to make a difference. Well, most cases end in settlement because there's pressure on both sides to do it. There's shame and apprehension on the victim's side, uh, and I think there's a lot of PR factor, especially for Catholic entities, scandal factor uh, that they want to avoid. So I'm done for today, sir. Thank you. And I believe no other council have questions. Am I correct on that? Right. Heads are nodding yes, so we can go off the record. I am the public face of the Brazilian Fathers. Hod Marshall was someone that I walked with through this whole journey uh, from the very first day I was in the office as the Vicar General uh, till the day he died. Uh, and I had people in my own community angry and upset with me that I was doing that so graciously and lovingly. But the only answer I could give them was that I had to because he was my brother. Uh, and we don't abandon our brother when things get tough. We journey with them through their own, their own death and resurrection, hopefully. With the percentages being about one or two percent of these cases go to trial, sex abuse trial lawyers are kind of like firemen that never leave the fire hall. You know, when you get the call and you get in the engine and you're heading to the fire and you're actually going to fight a fire, you're going to do a trial. Uh, it is very exciting. Rod McLeod's case went to trial because all of our attempts at settlement through mediation were unsuccessful. Mr. McLeod felt that 
we were not being fair and just in what we were willing to offer him as a settlement. All right, this is the totality of documents they provided us on first request. Mm -hmm. Marsh became a novice in 1942, and we know he was at least still acting in 1996. Yes, 54 years. And there's not a stitch of paper in his personnel file that they initially provided us that says he's an abuser, he has an issue with kids, he's been in medical treatment, anything. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nada. Mm -hmm. We're sitting here on the eve of a trial. A lot of people, after they've been victimized, especially for multiple times over multiple years as children, and then lived a very dysfunctional life, they don't have that ability to deal with the psychological stress. I think Rod felt that he got on to this a little late, wasn't able to participate in the police prosecution, uh, and so his cross to bear was to take this um, to a public trial. Rod, unlike most victims, was in a situation financially and psychologically that he could do that, and uh, not a lot of victims, a lot of survivors can. When we started sniffing around, they came out with the confidential memorandum. Norman Tank, priest, reports to Robert uh, Beringer, priest. In the course of our conversation, Father Marshall volunteered that this was not the only incident. His estimation is that there may have been around two to three high school boys per year from the early 1950s until 1979. Mm. The only note about him is very pious, his great interest in boys makes him neglect his theological studies. Yeah, right. Yeah. So if the guy that wrote this knew that he had been caught abusing a boy, he would look probably be more concerned about his great interest in boys, right? Yeah. This goes to show that either they didn't care or they didn't pass on the information. Ladies and gentlemen, let me begin by first thanking you for being here tonight. I am a lawyer, my name is Rob Talek. I represent the plaintiff, Mr. Rod McLeod. And Rod, as you will soon find out, is suing for something horrible that happened to him when he was young. Be the sexual abuse of Rod over many years when he was an adolescent at the hands of Father Hod Marshall. The only defendant is the Bazillions. They knew that Marshall was abusing boys and they did nothing. Imagine this. They take young men that want to be priests. They train them to be priests, but they also qualify them as teachers. They take an oath of poverty. They send these priests out into the world. And when it comes time for these Bazillion priests to get their teacher paycheck, they don't. All the paychecks, all the money goes to headquarters. They're big business. Look, we got four years of abuse over his teenage years. We've got fondling, we've got he lost his virginity, he was sodomized at least once, a priest and a teenage boy. This is devastating stuff. You find me many abuse cases that are worse than this. Father Marshall did abuse Roderick McLeod. It did happen. This proceeding is about determining the damage and then compensating Mr. McLeod for that damage. In this case, the Bazillion fathers that I represent accept that damage has been done. The crux of this matter is that the evidence does not support the degree of damage that Mr. McLeod and his counsel are asserting. This is not an exceptional case where Bazillion fathers act in a malicious, offensive, or high-handed matter toward Mr. McLeod, and consequently, there's no place for punitive damages against them in this matter. Thank you. I need to start by tickling you, and then very quickly it would become sexual uh, fondling. Had you had any sexual interaction with anyone prior to this? No. Okay. Does he ever get you to orgasm? He does, yeah. Is that your first sexual experience? Yes. Okay. And does this carry on over the grade nine year? It does, yeah. At what frequency or rate? It could be as frequent as three times a week, but uh, certainly no less than once a week. 
What were your fears if someone else had found out? Well, I, I uh, believed that uh, I, you know, I was just a kid and here was a priest, so obviously it'd be my fault and uh, you know, I'd be expelled and I, my parents would probably not want to have anything to do with me and all of that. Eventually one time it, it ended up with uh, him uh, penetrating me from behind. Sodomy. Yes. Looking back with the wisdom of years and some psychological guidance, what is the big effect that you want to leave with these people? Well, it's uh, just this overwhelming feeling of uh, not being worthy. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> even after five years of working through it and being aware of it, I still uh, have not uh, gotten over it. Okay. Let's, uh, I'll end there. With your permission, I'd like to give them a couple minutes. that the abuse led him to make the decisions that he made. I just was not convinced. I thought the defense's arguments were strong. It is about, is this person in pain? Have they suffered? We just had a gentleman stand up in a room with over 15 complete strangers. And completely lose his shit right in front of us. This person clearly is in pain and clearly is suffering. At no point in time did he seek diagnosis from a psychiatrist or receive a diagnosis that would look at PTSD or depression or... The pain and suffering only really became apparent to him as of that point. In the end, there is no question that the interference that he experienced at a young age and the responsibility of the defense, it, it did, it was enough. They do need to be responsible financially for that in the end. <laughs> <laughs> the jury that started in here, Jason, can you present your findings? How much do you award the plaintiff for his pain and suffering? We agreed on 200000 Do you award the plaintiff any money for the impact of his past earning capacity, past loss? And if yes, how much? We decided a million. Do you, as a group, award the plaintiff any money for the cost of future counseling and medication? And 50000 was what we decided. And for punitive damages for the conduct of the basilians, we awarded a million. Hey, Rod, how are you? Good, Rod, how are you? Let me just update you on some stuff that's just occurred, okay? Yep. I have heard from Miss Metzer. She's pretty polite in this email, trying to keep the demeanor and the, the tone between us conducive to maybe a settlement talk. Right. So I tell you that, I guess, in partial warning and preparation, that they may dive into settlement efforts on Monday. And we'll talk a little bit about that on the eve of on Sunday. Um, and what we want to do in response to that. I mean, I understand the simple position that you have right now, and I appreciate it being that simple, is there's our offer, take it or leave it, right? Right. Okay. And I, I, I hope they leave it. <laughs> I don't want them to take it. Right, right. So, and I've warned you previously that this is their style to drag the client or the victim through years of litigation, uh, make the lawyers do everything and you do everything, uh, and then to show up with their checkbook on Monday morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so subject to any questions, I'm going to get uh, back at it. Okay, sounds good. When the trial's done, so I could end up actually owing money, 
a big bill that I'll have to pay for the rest of my life. It's a very real danger that exists out there. That can shake you right to the, to the bone. But I, I try to just focus on my brothers who uh, went through the same thing that I have. I work in finance and costing and accounting over the course of my career, and if you ask my uh, family, they would quite succinctly say, I love numbers. I tend to analyze things uh, in that manner from a, a numeric perspective, a dollar and cents perspective, and it works for many things. It doesn't work for sexual abuse. I have spent most of my life blending into the background. When I'm not doing that, when I'm standing up and being heard, I am pushing myself with everything I have to be there. And I'm doing it because it's the right thing to do. It all begins for me really before I was born. Marshall was part of the family, almost like the family pastor. He would often stay at our house. Um, he was certainly welcome in our house anytime he wanted. And having a priest staying in the house was uh, an honor to my family, I guess was probably how they looked at it. He abused me in my own home, in my bed, and it just happened that my bedroom was the one that abutted my parents. Our beds uh, shared opposite sides of the same wall, and he was there in the night in my bed with me. As an adult, I look back now and say all I had to do was uh, knock on that wall, and my parents would have been coming in there uh, right in a hurry. I struggled for many years as to why I didn't do that, and I felt a lot of guilt about that. I kept it to myself for a very long time. A big part of my life was just wishing I could disappear off the face of the earth. In previous years, I had followed the criminal trial of Father Marshall. And Patrick McMahon, of course, was a huge part of that case. He was the first one to lay a criminal complaint in, in decades against this priest. So when Rod, Rod's case came to Toronto, he said, Patrick phoned me up and said, here's a case you might want to follow. And I thought, I'm going to be there. Attending the trial was never a question for me. I wouldn't have missed it for anything, really. Um, 
My objective was the exposure of his enablers in the church. And that is the bigger issue. That is the truly the bigger crime. So we're set to start a jury trial in Toronto, which should run between three and four weeks. The civil setting allows the victim, the client, to control the process and allows them to say how far it's going to go, how intense it's going to be. And that is extremely satisfying and cathartic for a lot of my clients. And I, I like to think that, you know, it is even more so than the money they ultimately see. I'm actually quite surprised that with what seems to be coming out more and more with the church scandals, is that there's not more of a flood of them. There still seems to be a lot of this under wraps. I had expected at some point the lid would blow off, that hasn't happened here, and I find that a little surprising. That may be because there have been so many settlements with non-disclosure agreements as part of them. Is this the courthouse that the pretrials are in? Though the tactical advantage of me having to go first is that I get the reply, right? But we have no idea what their argument is going to be. Right, really. right. And the judge might just take control of the whole process and, yeah. and fi start firing questions, right? right. Well, I think the first shocking impression is when you walk into this courtroom, it is small. I mean, it's the size of a high school classroom, really. The judge is slightly elevated in the center of the far end of the courtroom. He's not on this massive pedestal like you picture in Hollywood movies. The judge for the trial was His Honorable Justice Arthur Gaines, who is uh, someone I immediately Googled when I got his name. And uh, he's a colorful character, uh, very outspoken. The jury was a, a mix of male and female, more females than males. There was a good mixture of ages, although more on the high side than the low side. The lead defense lawyer is Susan Metzler. Where Susan and I differ, I think her specialty, if I can call it that, is defense of Catholic churches and entities. So we see her on a lot of files uh, across the country, frankly. You know, the joke is, you know, who's Superman and who's Lex Luthor? We each have different opinions on that, but uh, yeah, I know Susan well. And then behind all of us was the gallery. I kind of had this emotional thing going on of the day has finally arrived. I'm here, there they are in court answering for their crimes, even though I'm only here as a observer. The defense side had their two lawyers and the church representative. I felt like I was in a tomb. Uh, I was very much aware of the fact that there were a lot of eyes watching me to see how I was going to respond to anything that was being said or anything that was being done. It was a pretty heavy duty experience. We had already met, he, uh, he greeted me by name. I knew Susan Metzler, having dealt with her in my own suit. When they say, hello, Patrick, how are you? I want to say, well, I'm terrible. I was sexually assaulted as a child, and I had to spend years fighting you two. You want to know how I am? Come to my house sometime, and we'll spend five hours talking about it. But instead, I said, I'm fine. How are you? Ladies and gentlemen. Firstly, let me thank you for being here today. You are about to hear the real life story of Rod McLeod, of his 68 years, his triumphs and his tragedies, 
of his time here on this planet. And in order to do that, he will at times have to bear all on this stand. And you may feel that he is on trial, but he is not. He is the plaintiff. It is the defendants are on trial for the conduct of Father Marshall and themselves. Well, my opening statement was designed to set a theme to the trial, which uh, a good opening should. It was to introduce them to Rod and Rod's story life. And it was also, frankly, to get them a little irritated early on about what the Bazillion Fathers did and didn't do in this case. Marshall was like a toxic barrel of waste. And every time he abused, that barrel leaked. And every time there was a complaint, the Bazillions were alerted to the fact that the barrel was leaking and the reaction was simply to move it to another community and not tell that other community that it was a leaky barrel. The experience of listening to Mr. Talek describe Hod Marshall as a leaking barrel of toxic waste, uh, my initial impulse, remember I was in the military, uh, my initial impulse was to tackle him down onto the ground and throttle him. But it was, an, it was an awful moment. Because yes, he did awful, terrible things, but we have to always remember that he was also someone who was suffering from a terrible disease uh, that we didn't know about at the time that he was doing the stuff that he was doing to young people. Uh, is a pedophile, and, and a very good pedophile at that. I, I don't like talking about it, but people need to know the truth. I, I, I didn't know where to start. All I know is I wanted to see some justice done. It was just what I had to do. Good morning. at the moon, nobody listening. He might say, look, I, I got it. Yeah. Miss Metzler, in face of this law, what are you relying on? I think that's probably what will happen. Rod was our first witness, which is the norm. And we took a lot of time with Rod because I wanted the jurors to reach a conclusion and understanding about Rod before the defense got in there and tried to poke holes in it through the cross-examination. Well, the most difficult part is going over the, the details. For 55 years, I had buried it and uh, uh, had not spent any time whatsoever thinking about it to the, to the very best of my ability. It was uh, uh, extremely difficult. The only way that I, I could do it was I, I had uh, promised myself uh, that if I was going to, to trial that I wasn't going to leave anything out, that I was going to try and purge myself 100% of, of everything that had, had happened by going into the memory and, and uh, uh, speaking it out, hoping that that would, uh, would help to uh, uh, 
uh, finally start to heal the wounds. It goes without saying it's difficult because he's telling the story of his life and we're, and we're drilling down into like intimate details. You know, his sexual history, all the failures, financial, personal, everything that hasn't worked out for him, we have to touch on because that goes to the effect and the damages. So, I mean, it's difficult for anyone to sit there and talk about their failings for two days, but it's especially difficult for a victim of sexual abuse to do it. Father Kotelski was watching very intently. He was observing everything and, uh, and talking to his counsel. But this was important because it would appear that the Brazilians were going to accept some of the abuse that had happened to Rod McLeod. Listening to Rod's story just moves me to a profound sense of sadness inside of myself that it even had to happen, because it, it shouldn't have happened. It made me feel much more empathetic towards rape victims. The victims are um, too often subjugated to innuendo and to all kinds of very uh, hurtful, painful experiences the victims just end up being victimized even more by the justice system. Did I believe all of Rod's testimony? To the best as any human person can without knowing everything and having been there themselves, uh, he was credible, yes. So there's an offer on the table, as you know. It's substantial. You want to take it and be done, or do you want to g go on? My recommendation is to proceed. Mm -hmm. Aaron? It's a good offer, but at some level, it's a personal decision. You've had our advice. Yeah. That's a decision you're going to have to make. Well, you see, the, the problem is that if I accept it, uh, I live you know, to the end of my days thinking, why the hell did I do that? You know? The church can't understand somebody who isn't about the money because all they're about is the money. And I think the proof is if you took a priest like Marshall and he was the bursar and he went to Rochester and stole all the new building fund, would they have simply just moved him to Toronto and put him in charge of the bursary for St. Mike's and he steals all that? And then would they have simply moved him to Assumption, where he becomes the bursar again and steals all the money, would they put him in the, as a bursar again? Would they even keep him as a priest? You know, so I think the fact that you, it isn't about the money. They just can't grasp that. And mm -hmm. they think at some point they're gonna be able to put sufficient pieces of silver in your hand, because mm -hmm. they do view you as Judas, mm -hmm. and, and that you're gonna close your fist on that, walk out the door and everything's good again, so. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think the fact that they don't know who they're dealing with is our greatest strength. Mm -hmm. I want to go on. So to put the million dollar offer in perspective, it's about three to four times what the average good case settles for. I do what my client says, and you know, there was, I had two emotions. One was, wow, we really better do well here. Um, but the second one was kind of, you know, yes, we're going to be able to finish this. Uh, we're going to be able to get a verdict. Uh, and we're not going to have something where the church can just buy us out at the 11th hour. To have a client like Rod that says, damn the torpedoes, let's take this to the end, uh, was, was very encouraging. There are many things that the church can do so much better in this area. What about 
the bishops, cardinals, fellow priests, who knew. I don't see these people being called to account. Who's, who's being kicked out of the church, defrocked, and cut off all ties from the church because they moved an abuser around? I, I don't see that happening. for me. Don't talk to the victims. We don't want to know. Apparently I am no one's brother. You fellow was in the paper, right? Good morning. I've been in the paper. It makes me sick because I know I, I, like I knew Marshall, I, and I knew Father Leo Campbell, who was another one. Yep. And uh, more than more than we can count. My, the justice I wanted was I wanted it to be known who he was and what he did, and he I did. I, I was the first person to have charges laid against him. He went to jail for 19 victims. Wow. And uh, oh, that was just a small portion. He abused for 50 years. And uh, he went to jail for 18 months for 19 victims. So that was three weeks he How served old for was me. He when he went to jail? Uh, late 70s, I'm going to say. He had his whole life he abused children. They moved him from city to city and school to school. Every time he did it, they moved him again. You know what they're going to do? They're going to pay out millions and millions of dollars, and then they're going to come to us because they need more money. They just settled with the insurance company yeah. for millions but the amount is confidential. So you give them your money and they decide what to do with it and they won't tell you that. And Something has finally got to be done. If nobody went to church anymore for a few weeks, that would do it. You have a good day. Thank you for speaking with me. And thank you. So part of the story of Rod McLeod is the story of Father Marshall before Rod. And so we had attempted to bring in some walking, talking, living victims of Father Marshall from the decades before Rod, uh, and specifically ones that had reported Marshall. Walking in to the courtroom made me ill at ease. Reliving in my own mind the experience of Marshall uh, assaulting me was was very unnerving. It was it was uh, it was painful. It was hard to do. It's, it, it's hard to hold your emotions back when you describe it. The day I walked into Rod McLeod's trial, I wasn't intimidated whatsoever. I've been there before in a trial venue, so I spoke the truth, and that's what I basically always have said. Regarding Father Marshall, there's nothing, no pretenses, nothing to be shy or afraid of. So I spoke my mind freely. There was no personal, financial, or any other incentive to be there other than to expose the church for what they really are, what they've done to me and other victims of Marshall and others. The abuse with Father Marshall started late October 1969. Father Marshall asked me to remove my shorts. I was afraid. As I lowered my shorts, he came up to me, grabbed my penis. He whispered in my ear and he gritted his teeth, that smile of his, if I tell anybody, I will be going to hell. He whispered it in my ear. He uh, stopped me in the hallway and brought me into an empty classroom. And he began to assault me there by putting his arms around me, pinning my arms down and then putting his hands inside my clothing to fondle. A priest opened the door, walked in, turned around and said, excuse me, and walked out again. He could see exactly what Marshall was doing. 
He used to bring me back to his room and, and refer to it as a workout. He was assaulting me in his bedroom when another priest walked in, had somebody with him and said, oh, this room is busy. The attorney for the bazillions say that, is it possible that they didn't see you? Oh, you bastard. I said, only if they had their eyes closed. I asked my parents to sit down at the kitchen table, and I told them what happened. So my father came after school about 3.10. My father couldn't speak English that well, but he says, my son says Father Marshall touched him in an inappropriate way, and, and Father Lacoco sort of laughed. And your son, I've talked to Ted's teachers, he's a good student, but he tends to exaggerate. Uh, he has a very vivid imagination. I was looking for help. Hard to find. Well, I went into confession at Sacred Heart Church. Uh, I didn't, I didn't co come on with the normal ritual of bless me, Father, and all that. I said, I have, I have a problem. And I didn't know how to describe it. He said, what is it? I said, a Catholic priest was touching impure parts of my body. I didn't even know what to, how to describe it. And he said, what did you do? Stop doing that, it's your fault. The language of cover-up, that, that speaks of some kind of intentionality on the part of individuals who are deceased that I don't have any documents of people whom I respected uh, and knew as good men and good priests. I believe in my heart of hearts, at least from my community perspective, that they were doing what they felt was the best practice of the day. For them to deny knowledge is totally inappropriate. I know better and they know better. Marsha would never have imagined that generations of his victims would be coming together in the same courtroom to indict him, you know, and that's what we're doing here. I would think most right-thinking people would have difficulty with a transfer after a transfer after a transfer after a transfer after a transfer with a report of sexual abuse at each of these locations. And the thing that I think will be in the, uh, give the indigestion the most is in 1992 when they find out he's abused upwards of 50 boys or more. And they don't tell the police, they don't tell CAS, they don't even reach out to try to find Nothing. the victims. Yeah, just yeah. close the book on it. Yeah. So that's got to be, 1996, nobody can say we didn't know and it was a moral failing and we didn't know better. The most educated, international, worldly group of folks, a subunit of the Roman Catholic Church, is basically using the defense of, duh, to say we didn't know better is gonna stink up the whole courtroom. So on one of the breaks, I went to the washroom and about the same time, Father Kotalski came in behind me uh, and we're both at the urinal side by side sort of awkward and I would normally say something to sort of break the awkwardness but as I was about to I heard a, a whimpering a, a, a crying uh, clearly from a grown man but 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 the sort of the thing you'd hear from a boy uh, and it was coming from the stall in the bathroom and I quickly realized it was one of the victims who had come to testify or watch that day uh, and I just remained silent I, I thought it was important for Father Kotalski, as representative of the church, to hear that, to hear the pain that was still emanating from a grown man for something that had happened decades before. So we just sat there quiet in the bathroom and listened to this whimpering. If anyone witnessed that, I, I have no problem with that at all. If it affected them seeing the true impact of these crimes on just one of many victims, maybe that's 
beneficial in some way. I, I don't know, but I always think the truth is the most beneficial thing to present to people, and that was my truth, part of my truth. Do you remember that day? I do remember that day, yes. Can you tell me what you were thinking? Uh, what I was basically thinking was that this is a man that needed someone to be with him in his grief, and I was not, unfortunately, the person that could be, do that and be that. That's what I was thinking. Dr. McMaster was the specialist that we had, the expert that we had, who did an interview of, of uh, Mr. McLeod and gave his psychological opinion of, of Mr. McLeod. Dr. McMaster had a very uh, Clark Kent look. He was very confident, he was very uh, sure of himself, and there would be no uh, real debate, I am going to give this testimony and we don't really need to discuss it because you don't know nearly as much as I do, so just take my answer and we're done. So Dr. McMaster, who's routinely hired by the defense and the church, his job is to frankly, to find any other reason why Rod had difficulty in life and or to say, hey, these weren't difficulties at all. Dr. McMaster seemed to um, indicate that it would be highly unusual for someone to be uh, that badly affected through the balance of, of his life. He believed that my sexual abuse was in the low end of the scale. In meeting other victims, the effect that it has on them is so profound, for so long, so fundamental, that I can't understand how a psychiatrist, how he could be so completely uh, ignorant of the, uh, the effects of, of that abuse. Okay, so Rod, you didn't like me attacking him. Do you still hold that opinion? Well, I, I, I don't like the idea of you being another um, uh, Susan. Susan. So if you're going to attack him, you have to do it with... Um, a sympathetic polite. Yeah, as though you're not attacking him at all, that you're just clarifying things, yeah. you know, the way the judge did. <laughs> <laughs> Afternoon, doctor. Can we start with some agreement before we disagree? because I'm sure we will. Can we agree that assessing victims of sexual abuse is not your main expertise? My interaction with Dr. McMaster involved a level of frustration and disdain because this is a professional whose job is to aid the court and he was really deep into advocate territory. Your focus has been assessing the people that make the victims, the offenders, right? And I think that fueled me to do a more aggressive and hopefully effective cross-examination of him. Remember Catherine Thompson from Barry? She's a babysitter that made child pornography with the children that she was entrusted to and also engaged in bestiality. Yeah, you provided an opinion to keep her from being a designated long-term offender, right? Rob Talek did not have any kind words really for Dr. McMaster on, on his cross. Talek was, I think, rather dismissive in his cross-examination, and he actually accused Dr. McMaster of being some sort of puppet for the defense. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna call Rod in a second, but uh, I mean, part of me says today went well enough that I could end. Because, I mean, just, just think about that for a minute. What if he goes home, does his homework, he comes back? Wouldn't it be great in the morning to ask him a couple questions that are key before he sees that window to throw his repair jobs in, and then I just go, boom, I'm done? You know, I think the, the more he talks, the more the judge and the jury uh, seem to turn against him, you know? Like, when he suggests that 
Rod could derive some self-esteem oh from the God. abuse by Marshall. The juror at the end totally lost it. Hey Rod, how are you? Good Rod, how are you? A decision that we were just discussing is, do I do the short version tomorrow or the long version? In other words, <clears throat> this doctor is probably going to go home, actually he is going to go home, and he's going to get into the books and try and rebuild himself tomorrow. I think we're in a pretty good position right now. I sure would hate to see that uh, be eroded, you know? We just cut it short and get rid of him, dump him. Look, I want you to leave with this thought. Part of what you, you're doing here is to create ripple effect, bigger good in society beyond this, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. You have eliminated an enemy of the victim today. And I'm going to say in closing, this is the guy that the church chose to represent them. Yeah. Says volumes of the lengths they would go to to protect their, their brand. Exactly, exactly. While Father Marshall was still alive, uh, we moved for a court order to be able to videotape his evidence. We wanted the Marshall video played as late as possible in the trial, so that would be one of the last things the jurors would, would hear from us, at least, and, and even hear from the trial process before they went to decide things, so people could see this sort of unrepentant, cavalier, priest, monster, in my words, give his evidence. State for the record uh, your full name. <clears throat> William Hodson Macklin Marshall. It was quite something. I'd never seen anything quite like that in a courtroom. Here was a, a dead priest confessing to almost four decades of crime. There were 17 individuals that you pled guilty to abuse. Yes. But they had the monitors up in the courtroom. Yes. Some of the spectators couldn't watch because they'd been abused by him. Most of these victims from the convictions were boys when you sexually abused them. That's right. And most of these victims were boys at schools you were working at at the time you abused them. Most, yes. To have this evidence from the grave in front of you, it was very powerful and the courtroom was silent. And you would have shared your struggle with abuse with spiritual director? Yes. And so this would be a fourth spiritual director you made aware of this? Yes. And again, you weren't told to go seek any outside assistance? No. I considered leaving. I'm not even sure why I, I stayed. Somehow I felt I, I just had to hear his words and, and see what he thought of his own actions. Did you abuse John Moran, that assumption? I can't remember that at all. You abused Jerry Boyle? Yes. Is it fair to say that you can't remember all your victims from St. Charles? I think so. Do you remember abusing Rod cloud during those early years of St. Charles? Yes, I do. When Rob Talek was putting questions to him and asking him about specific boys, he said, and this was kind of heartbreaking to me, I, said, I, I don't remember him, or I, I might have remembered him, or it could have possibly happened. I mean, there were so many instances, so many young boys, he couldn't even remember who they were. Is it fair to say that almost every school you taught at, you would have sexually touched boys? With a few exceptions, yes. It was frankly shocking because there wasn't a lot of denial in there. I mean, this is a man who had been protected by the church over the decades every time he got caught. And I think it built in him sort of a who cares sort of attitude and he told it as it was. Sir, this has been a problem that spanned most of your career, is that fair? That's right. You were convicted of that along with other crimes in June of 2011. That's right. No guilt for all those years. No concern that he would be going to meet his maker and have to answer for his crimes. 
things weren't done the same way in those days that they are now. We didn't realize the seriousness of the, of the crime. Well, you knew in those days, sir, that it was a criminal offense, correct? I imagine so, but... You knew it was a breach of the Ten Commandments? Yes. You knew it was a breach of your vow of chastity and celibacy? Yes. You knew it was wrong? Yes. Okay, I'm just gonna put some thoughts here and see how it goes on a very practical basis. Oh, I already have a document here called Closing Thoughts. I gotta put this in plain English. How's this line sound? This will be the last time I call him the plaintiff. He is rod to me, and I suspect after hearing so much about his life, he should be rod to you as well. I think the more human he is to them, the more difficult it is for them to be harsh in the figures. The hope is that he will walk out of this courtroom no longer victimized, but finally vindicated. This question deals with additional money based on the nature of what Rod endured. It allows more money on top of the general damages. This is allowed if what Rod endured was humiliating, oppressive, or undignified. We all agree that he endured sexual abuse for four years approximately 50 times. We all agree that it included fondling, oral sex, and ejaculation. The defendant, in fact, agrees that aggravated damages do apply to Rod. This question is simply one of how much. Absolutely. How can Sorry. I share Good your morning. pain? Good morning. How can I share your pain? You can tell me why the church fights against the victims instead of against the abusers. I wish I could. I wish I could. I wish you I, could I, too. I, I would have to know it in order to be able to tell you, and I can't. This I mean, is a fair answer. To me, it's. Why does it continue? Why, well, that's what I mean. It's. How, it's how does it get horrendous. stopped? Some, the system has to change totally. That is a start. I've gone to four churches this weekend because I knew the bishop's statement was going to be put out. Was it read here today or? No, we didn't read it. We read it on Thursday is what they asked us to do and it's in the bulletins today. Yes. So yes. I talked about it, but I didn't read it. You know, you don't want to keep having to talk about something over and over, but until it's fixed, it's what you have to do. Because even right today, victims come forward and they're not believed. No, I know. And, uh, and the church brings out their lawyers and they fight them. They fought me. The closing arguments in Rod McLeod's case were quite different. The church's side accepted that Rod McLeod had been abused uh, to a certain degree, but clearly were pushing back on, 
on any notion that it was a, a lifelong um, kind of suffering that would impact financial earnings. That was kind of my, my take on, on the defense's close. Rob Talek, on the other hand, pressed a lot of phrases and buttons that I thought a jury might really listen to. Members of the jury, you may recall that I put to Father Katolsky the example of Marshall being like a toxic barrel of waste. And every time he abused, that barrel leaked. And the church's reaction was simply to move that barrel to new communities and not tell them of the waste that was in their backyard. It's hard to tell by looking at their faces, but I think they were hanging on to these kind of images and making something that can be big and awful like, you know, sexual assault a little more understandable when he put it in those terms. And he really did hammer on the amount of time that Father Marshall was allowed to continue his abuse, which was decades and decades and decades, and that it could have been stopped in the 1940s had anyone had any guts. And years later, when the extent of that leak and the number of communities involved was known to the church, they didn't go back and say, hey, there was something bad here in your community that might have hurt your children. We're here to help. We're here to clean it up. There was none of that. At the end of the trial, when all of the evidence had been presented and it was about to be handed over to the jury, I felt relieved, and I felt relieved for one reason, that this was going to be over, uh, and we could all get out of there. We could all get out of the tomb. As the jury is about to retire at the end of the trial, I'm thinking uh, that we have done everything that we possibly could do. I was very confident of that. Uh, what I was not confident of was how the jury would react to everything that had been said. They could come back and uh, they could fall completely on the side of the defense and uh, uh, there'd be absolutely nothing you could do about it. You're thinking, boy, this could be really bad. Waiting for the verdict is nerve-wracking, uh, and the longer the verdict takes, the more nerve-wracking. You start to, to wonder, you know, what are they thinking? It, it could go any way. Uh, it could be a big win. It could be a big loss. And there was really nothing that we could do, and so uh, it was just a matter of passing the time. Look at our focus group. They took, we gave them an hour. Yeah, but we didn't give them information, the kind of information. No, that's right, that's what I'm getting at. Like, yeah. they took their full hour. Oh, yeah. They kind of wrote off the punitive question and just in five minutes said, yeah, a million. But they took a lot of time considering how little they got, right? They got yeah. about an hour of evidence and they took an hour of time. Yeah. So hopefully these folks don't take three weeks. But. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can only hope that the religious beliefs of this jury help us. They know that this, oh, it's all okay, just go pray, is bullshit. There's no stricter regime than the Catholic Church in the 50s. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. Amen. Last week, after the 11 o'clock Mass, I was rather surprised because when I walked out onto the steps at the, down at, on the sidewalk at the base of the steps stood a man holding a sign. 
the victim of clergy sex abuse. And I didn't quite know what to say or what to do. Patrick McMahon was abused by Father Hod Marshall, a Brazilian who was principal here at Assumption and, and then Holy Names. And he was a good, a close family friend of theirs. And he abused him over a number of years and he's in deep pain. And his sign was written on both sides, two different things, a quote from Pope Francis and then something of his own. And on one side, it said, ask how you can share in my pain. I think that is one of the biggest challenges of us who call ourselves Christian, is to share in someone else's pain. I think Patrick did me a great favor by giving me the cue card right in front of me. Ask how you can share in my pain. My prayer is that I might keep that cue card in front of me and ask others how I can share in their pain. But thank you for coming. Thank you again for speaking with me. And I shouldn't have hugged you without asking. I didn't want to. It's okay. Too much in your history, but I'm sorry. No, it's I not a problem. Okay. I couldn't hug you back properly holding this sign. Yeah. But I okay. appreciate it. All right. And uh, I think well of you. Thank so. you. Same here. I, I admire your courage immensely. Thank you. If there's, well, whatever I can, whenever I can be of service, you let me know. Okay. We'll I will do that. Keep in touch. Okay. I'm not gonna stop because they haven't stopped. When they stop, maybe I'll stop. But they're abusing, they're covering it up, they're lying, they're cheating, they're fighting against the victims. So as long as they keep doing that, I'll keep doing what I'm doing. I'll be in court, I'll be outside churches, I'll be on television, and until they, if they get tired of me, they can stop doing what they're doing. There'll be a lot of cutting the baby in half to get the thing done, right? Because it's taking so long, there, there's got to be at least two people, you know, uh, two or three against, you know, three or four. Well, the first hour was probably completely ineffective, just bumbling around, people talking about the thing that they were most moved by and da da da, just some airing of grievances type thing. And then, depending on the foreman, you know, then they get down to work. By that time, it's 10:30, and they're they're still taking their silly little coffee breaks and stuff. I'm sure of it, you know. God, could you imagine having a hung jury? We were pretty confident on a quick turnaround, and. Uh, I think as we went into the afternoon, uh, we, were, we were getting nervous. It, it got pretty intense by the time we got the phone call saying the jury was back in. 
Hello, Rob speaking. Okay, we are on our way over. We're, uh, we'll be there within five minutes. We got a verdict. Let's roll. And then finally, the, uh, the jury had reached a, a verdict. I could just tell by the look on her face when she stood up to give the verdict that I knew it was not going to be a pleasant experience, and uh, I was not disappointed in that at all. At what amount, if any, do you assess the claim for past loss of income? Zero dollars. At what amount, if any, do you assess the claim for future loss of income? Zero dollars. At what amount do you assess the claim for general damages? $350,000. At what amount do you assess the claim for aggravated damages? $75,000. At what amount do you award as punitive damages against the Bazillion Fathers of Toronto? $500,000. At what amount, if any, do you award for lump sum income loss? $1,588,781. Awesome. This was, changes everything. It changes everything. It changes everything. Yeah, it's unbelievable, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the grand total was $2,570,000. That judgment was more money than all my other judgments I've ever obtained combined. Just the <laughs> Astronomical, uh, a record breaker. I think they got it bang on. And 500, just right in punitive. Because yeah. if they, they went can't over a million, it, yeah. it could say it's absurd. That was glorious. Two and a half million dollars, and here's exactly what you did. We know you did it, and we know you knew you were doing it. That was victory, and that was what I was there for. It went beyond what I even speculated would be the results. It, it was hard. It was hard. It was another moment of shame that I experienced and felt and a profound sadness that I always have and always carry with me with regards to these matters that we're talking dollars and cents, which does not bring about the healing that the person really needs. I hope this outcome will cause the Brazilians to rethink their position on how they treat sex abuse victims. Stop listening to their legal experts and listen to their hearts and the teachings of Jesus Christ. Oh my God, that's awesome. This represents the largest award of punitive damages against the Catholic Church in Canada. It's the first time that a jury of average citizens have judged the church's handling of sexually abusive priests. It marks a turning point for the church in Canada who, to date, have only been required to pay for the damage they cause victims, but have never been fined or punished for their institutional conduct and complicity. The hope is that this outcome will motivate change within the Catholic Church. Bo me. Hey, come on. <laughs> come on. Come on. All right. <laughs> When I heard you testify, I heard you say very good things. You were saying, we're gonna take responsibility for this, we have the ability to pay for this, we, we acknowledge this. Why did you appeal?
I don't know how much of that kind of, uh, that question I should answer. I would advise not to answer that. That's because right. It's under uh, study. That's right. The appeal was not a surprise. Instead of saying, oh my God, look at what we have done. Look at what we've done and look at the reaction of the public. What we've done is so wrong. We must make amends. But no, that's not what they did. They went right back to their old behavior. Oh, there's a possibility that we may be able to claw some of this back. Let's take it. When it came right down to it, they reacted in a way in which any profit-making organization would. Never will you see the change come from inside the church. This has been 10 years in the making. Here's to all our friendship. Cheers. Cheers. Let's Cheers. keep doing it. Cheers. 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 My whole purpose of going to trial was not money. My whole purpose was to get the story out into the public as much as I possibly could. Not just for myself, but for all the others who had been sexually abused just as I had. That to me was the best thing that could have happened out of this trial. <laughs>